that's why we got a lot of people out today. They're, they're taking their last clean for summer. And uh, who was somebody said you can't wear white after September and all this good kind of stuff? I, I, I can pay no attention to that. Amen. Matter of fact, I just tell the Lord, pick me out whatever you want me to wear. <laughs> Amen. But for most marriages, it's Labor Day, and the opinion of some, if you really stop and think about it, it's the most hypocritical day in the year. I mean, if you, if this Labor Day is a celebration of the rights and the privilege that we have to work and labor in the United States of America, then why don't we celebrate it by going in in the morning and telling the boss, look, it's Labor Day, so I'm just going to work for free today. Well, that would have been like a lead balloon. No, we're not going to do that, are we? We're not going to celebrate that. Just tell them I'm going to work for you today just for the joy of working. I'm having such a good time. Let me ask you a few questions. We're not quite that dedicated to Labor Day, are we? Do you really like your job? How many of you look forward to going to work Monday morning because you really miss seeing your boss? And how many of you miss your fellow workers so much that you can't hardly wait to get back to see them Monday morning? Now, I doubt very few of you, but you didn't seem very enthusiastic about that, uh, like you really missed them. If you answered yes to those questions, you're in a minority, I will promise you that. Surveys have revealed that 65% of Americans are unhappy with the job. Most of them don't work on the side, oh, I know, because off the work I go. Amen. <laughs> That's about it. And you can probably tell they're unhappy with what they do because it's the same old routine. You're in a, how many of you ever been in a boring job? Say it again. I mean, you, just, you ever get the feeling you get up in the morning, you go to work, you come home, you eat supper, you go to bed, you get up in the morning, you go to work, you come home, you eat supper, you go to bed. You know, where's the thrill in this? The truth of the matter is, thank God we got a job. Amen? Thank God we got a job. Now, Listen, this country has some problems. I'm very much aware of those problems. But if we look at the church, we will get rid of it. <laughs> <I'm just saying. laughs> um, it's still the greatest country in the world. Amen? I, I've got Shannon and Emmy on service being with me, myself and Gary and, and Billy. Billy, how many years did you put in? Eleven and a half. Eleven and a half. So, you know, it's still the greatest country in the world. Thank God for those that have put that time in. Tennessee Ernie used to sing a song. Tennessee Ernie Ford used to sing a song. 16 tons, and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. Someone else sang and said, Up this morning, I own a job, worked like a devil for my pay, fussed with my woman, told for my kids, worked till I wrinkled and gray, but that lucky old son just rolled around heaven all day. And that's the one day we're looking forward to being like that, rolling around heaven. Now, this morning, I want to share with you what I believe will help you see your job. Wherever you're at, whatever God has you doing, listen to me now, whatever God has you doing right now, He has you there for purpose. And it's not to fulfill that job as it is to glorify Him. Wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, God has divinely ordained and put you in that position for a while. If Bill was here, he could tell you, he used to come to me all the time and say, Preacher, I can't keep working that job I'm at. I said, You can. And we talked, and he said, no, you just don't understand. Well, make a long story short, he started listening. I started looking for opportunities to witness. Before he left that job, he was able to have Bible study with his workers in the morning. He was able to have prayer time with him. In other words, it turned it around. That's what you do on your job. This morning, I want to ask you some, just some very simple things, make some simple statements that I think will uh, enable you to go to work on Monday morning. Well, Tuesday morning, because nobody's going to work anymore. She's going to go to work with a different attitude. First of all, our problem in this life is we divide secular and sacred into two different positions. We say, well, this is sacred work, and this is secular work. We, we say, over here's sacred, over there's sacred. We spend the best hours of our day every day in the secular world, so to speak. And we really like to serve God, but we say, I have to spend so much time on this secular job. So we give God a few hours on Sunday morning, maybe a few hours on Sunday, Wednesday night, and that's about all for a lot of people. But you see, you see that pattern in the Old Testament. You see in the Old Testament a pattern of this is sacred and this is sacred. But you don't see that in the New Testament. And the New Testament is very different. The New Testament teaches that we're all priests, that we, our body is a temple of God, and that the Holy Spirit lives in us each and every day. Now, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon you. Uh, 
let me reiterate this again so people understand. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon somebody, dwell for a little while, and then leave, and then come back to empower him again. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes and stays. He never departs. I mean, who's born again? <laughs> if you're born again, say, say amen. amen. And you have the Holy Spirit living within you. If you're saved, born again, child of God. He never departs. So therefore, there is no such thing as secular and sacred. It's all sacred. God wants you to take that secular job and make something sacred out of it. And listen, the Bible tells us that he's every, he's in, in every part. There's three things I want you to think about today. Number one, you see your everyday work as a service for God. Now, it may be hard if you're flipping hamburgers to see how you're doing that job. The truth of the matter is, you're waiting on somebody. You're providing a service. You're providing a need to something that somebody needs. Do you realize that almost everything we do affects someone else? We have food because they're farmers. We have uh, um, uh, tables and chairs because they're people that can work, on wood, work with wood and make what we need. Everything that you do affects somebody else. Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life in a little town of Nazareth helping his earthly father in, in the carpentry shop. Why? Because work is important. So you think you just went out and found that job. If you're a child of God, God doesn't have any accidents. You didn't find that job accidentally. God sent you there. You said, that's divine providence. Yes, it is. God has all things in control. And by the way, sometimes we try to change jobs before God gets ready to move us. Amen. We try to change jobs before God gets ready to move us. If God won't move you, he'll move you. Give him time. And if I am once in a while, I preach this. I preach this before people say, yeah, I've never thought about my job as being my ministry. Your job is part of your ministry. If you're a child of God, you're somebody's a teacher, you're a full time minister. Hey, I got news for you. You're a full time minister too. Amen? You're, the Bible says we are full time ministers. We just work a secular job part time, but we're to take that job and minister through that job. Have you ever thought about that? Find ways in your job that you can minister to the people around you. Now, I'm going to try to tell you how to do that before we close here today. But the first thing I want you to realize is that you, your, your work is a service for God. By the same time, remind me, listen, we have responsibilities. We, what we say, what we do are important. And it makes a difference to people around you. How many of you know what you say makes a difference? You can hurt somebody's feelings with what you say. Or you can build them up with what you say. You can tear them down or you can make them feel like they're the most important person in the world. Or you can make them feel like they're that small. Just by what you say. And by the way, just so you know, you don't have to cuss somebody out to do that either. Amen? Amen. My wife will tell you, I, I'm better now than I used to be. <laughs> when I used to be able to cut somebody down and stop that and never say anything wrong, just be frank. Sometimes, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Amen? Amen. So, I'm working on it. I'm not there yet. So don't look at me like I am. And don't expect me to be. I'm working at it. I'm getting there. I ask God to help me every day. But what I'm you build people up. So when you're on the job and you're working with a co-worker and he does something that's just plain stupid, don't tell him that. Just say, why don't you try doing it this way? Let's try a different approach to it. And encourage him to lift him up. You serve God. Listen, Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies a living sacrifice only and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. We serve God in the way we work, in the world we work every day. Number two, you can serve God where you work. And people say, they tell the preacher, you don't know where I work. You don't know my boss. You don't know the people I have to work with. You don't know the power struggles that go on. You don't know about the flirtations at work. You don't know about the cursing. You don't know about the dirty stories. You don't know about the pornography passed around. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. I read that to you. Slaves obey your human masters. I'm going to put the, I'm going to replace the word slaves there with workers. As a matter of fact, one, verse, one translation says, Workers obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor with their eyes on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Now, it's interesting. What he's saying here is, even though you're about, your boss may be a two legged monster who's about to pay, about as pagan as anyone you've ever seen, do your work for him as though you were doing it for Christ. That's what he says. Are you understanding that? He may be a pagan. He may be one that you, 
you think, well, he's as far from heaven as he can ever get. That's all right. Do the work in him just like you were doing the work for Christ. Do what he tells you, when he tells you, the way he tells you. Amen. And by the way, that don't mean caressing you, and it don't mean one go off and mumble under your voice either. Amen. Preach, preacher. That's right. right. Well, if I have to amen and preach to it, it's going to take twice as long. You say, you don't know my boss. Or you never suggest I work in that pagan office in a pagan country. There is no way Christian principles will ever change that. Ask Bill Toon. Perfect example. I want to take you back to the Old Testament for a minute. You say, well, that didn't happen in the Old Testament. Yes, it did. How many of y'all remember the story of Daniel? Daniel. You've heard about Daniel. Ever since you were in Sunday school, he was carried away captive into Babylon from Jerusalem, but he was surrounded by people who were in Jerusalem. They surrounded people who believed what he believed, believed in one God. Now he's in a totally pagan environment in Babylon. Babylon. You know where that is? What we call around Iraq today. That area. In Babylon. And uh, at the time, King Nebuchadnezzar appointed him as a government official. Now, here is a man, here is a child of God that's in a pagan country serving a pagan king and has now been appointed a government official. He's a government bureaucrat. Let me tell you now, if you want to get far away from God, just become a government bureaucrat. Hello? You don't believe it? Look at Washington. <laughs> a certain kind of environment, you listen. Become a bureaucrat and you get far away from God most of the time. Now, there are some exceptions, but they're very few and far between. And Daniel worked in his government office, sitting behind his government desk, doing all his duties as a government bureaucrat would do, and he was still able to serve God. Nebuchadnezzar respected his faithfulness to his God so much that he kept making him higher and higher as a leader of the country. When Nebuchadnezzar died, the Babylonian Empire began to disintegrate. It finally was conquered by King Darius. But once again, Daniel, in his capacity, had outstanding qualities that Darius recognized, and he was soon appointed one of the highest officials in the land of men. There came a time when the pressure was on him, and he said, that's enough. So Daniel said, that's as far as I go. And King Darius, who may be listening to this now, listen, listen to me, people. This is the influence that a godly man has on a pagan country, on a pagan king. Listen to what Darius said to him. He said, listen, Daniel got thrown in the, in the fire, and uh, Darius came up, and when he reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel. He said, Daniel, servant of the living God. The king said, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from, from the lion's den? Excuse me, the lion's den. Rescue you from the lion's He said, see, this pagan king recognized the God of Daniel. That, that, listen, that's the kind of influence you can have on your job working for a pagan employer if they see godly character and godly qualities in your If they see you doing a good job, if they see you, you know, not participating in everything they do, all the, the uh, dirty jokes and stuff like that, you're not, not participating, but you're doing a good job for them, they'll see a difference. And you know what happens? After a while, they'll hit a trouble spot in their life. And they'll come up to me and say, I know there's something different about you. You handle things different. What is it? I need that kind of peace. I need that kind of security. And God will open the door for you to tell them about Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who's coming back again. Say amen. amen. He's on the throne. He's coming back again. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? David worked in a pagan environment. He worked in a pagan office for a pagan king. Yet one thing you knew this pagan king knew about Daniel is that Daniel served God continually. So apply that to yourself. Do your fellow workers know that? Do they know you try to serve God continually in the environment of your work? Have they seen you as a walking temple of God? Have you been able to put God first where you work? Say, well, Daniel was an extraordinary man. I'm just an ordinary person. Well, thank God you are. If I look around, I think God made more ordinary people than he did extraordinary people. Amen? I mean, he didn't make a whole lot of geniuses. And he didn't make a lot of very fine, talented people, but he made a lot of ordinary people. Let me tell you something. God takes an ordinary person, fills him with his Holy Spirit, and enables him to do extraordinary work. Amen. Amen? Amen? That's the way God works. That's the way God makes you extraordinary. 
God delights in taking ordinary people and foolishly infusing them with extraordinary power, the power of the Holy Spirit. Number three, I'll finish with this one. All of us are ministers. All of us are ministers. I wish I could preach. I wish I could do what you do. I wish I were a preacher. Now, I will tell you, before I was a preacher, I spent years working in such your daughters. I was, I've been able to keep you. Alyssa told me one time, she said, Dad, is there anything you haven't done? I mean, I'm a farmer. I work on a shrimp boat. Lord, that, uh, I remember when I got off the farm. I told my daddy, I joined the Navy. I told my dad, I said, I'm going there. They put me down at a station down at uh, Wilmington uh, in the reserve status. And so I had to find a job down at Surf City. I went and found me a job. I told daddy when I left the farm, I ain't never farmed anymore. Hardest work I ever done. I mean, I'm, I still remember pulling lugs. How many of you know what I mean when I say pull lugs? Man, they kill you. You want to get on your back. I mean, you've been over the pulling lugs. Daddy said, I said, my back's killing me. He said, you're too young to have a back. I said, well, what's that going on? It's hurting. <laughs> well, what's going to be at that? It's hurting. But yeah, I told us, I ain't doing any more farm work. So I got me a job at Harry's Bay Packing Shop in Surf City. Not there down there. Down they got a uh, some kind of clothing store. But anyhow, we would get up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and go out and shrimp till about 8 o'clock. I said, man, I sure would let you back on the farm. It's about to kill me. I'm done that. I'm, um, I, yeah, you know what I'm talking about? It, that stuff works. But yeah, I've done that. I shrimp. Uh, I'm trying to think what all I have done. I was a mechanic for a while. It's not a good one, but I was a mechanic. Um, I was at the service station. I went I was in and out, I was a grill, uh, uh, a curb boy. You might know what a curb boy is. I'd come out and take their orders on the car and go fix their, fix their hamburgers, whatever, bring them back to the car. And I got to be a pretty good one. I figured I could figure I could pull a joke on anybody. I ever had a man come one time ask me for a pine plate. He said, I'll give you a $25 tip if you bring me a pine plate. I said, all right, be glad to. I got me a $25 tip. Uh, <laughs> no, you know what a pine plate is? Take a glass of water, put a toothpick in it. That's a piece of pine plate. <laughs> so, yeah, I had, I had folks that whatever I've done, I've always tried to have fun. I've always tried to enjoy what I'm doing. Um, I, I worked as a collection agent for a while for uh, financial services. That was fun. Got robbed doing that. Amen. Got robbed at night for doing that. After the night, my next would be all the money you got. I said, okay, he had his three dollars. Cost that guy ten dollars in bills for every three dollars, every dollar he got. <laughs> I thought it was everything. Then I was a uh, copier technician, repairing copiers, back machines, and working with all kinds of equipment like that. And from there, I went to a biomedical technician at Rex Hospital. Had a good job. Was going to pay me okay. Make a long story short, I know what it's like to be in such a workplace. So when you tell me I wish you had your had your job, you wouldn't have to. I wouldn't have to work. Here. I know what it's like. I know what you face. I've been there. And even since then, I've worked part time at the grocery store, at Lowe's Food Store, I've worked part time there. So I know that you face stuff. Uh, I know the foul language. I know the things that go on in a secular workplace. And I'm very thankful that God put me in ministry. But I want you to understand that you're a servant of God no matter where you're at. On the job, you're still God's servant. Whether I'm in the pulpit, visiting, preaching, Working in a store, I'm still a servant of God. I'm still a minister of God. That never changes. If you're a Christian, you are a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. Say amen. 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 Look at somebody and tell them, I'm a minister of Jesus Christ. Tell them. It'll do good. Confession is good for the soul. See, so somebody said, well, I don't feel like, I don't feel like I'm much of a minister. No matter if you make it what you feel like, God works through. Say amen. amen. I said, you're a minister. You say, well, I'm a victim of circumstances. I had this job because I couldn't get the one I wanted. <laughs> and I have to make a living, and I hate every minute of it. Daniel was a victim of circumstances as well. He didn't choose to be taken in captivity, but he was. Why was Daniel in Babylon? The answer is, listen, in verse Jeremiah 29, 7, God said, I have carried you into exile. I have carried you from Jerusalem to Babylon. I have caused you to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. God said, you're here because I can send you there. I say again, if you have a job, you're there because God, if you're a child of God, because God put you there. Amen? And he's not going to let you leave until you get ready. That's what I kept telling you. <laughs> God ain't going to let you leave until he gets ready for you. Listen, the Bible 
tell you that, listen, he was a victim of circumstances. But it's where God wanted him to be. The Bible teaches that you can overcome evil with good. Say amen. amen. We've always heard one bad apple for the whole barrel. And uh, so long that we think the bad always wins, but I'm good, good, and the good never wins. I'll tell you something, good always wins. The Bible teaches we can overcome evil with good. And if you're in a secular workplace working next to a pagan, then see that as a God-given opportunity to influence that person with the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That person who you come to work with every day, this is me, that person who took the time the other day to tell you, man, let me tell you what happened today. My wife and I went over there, we bought this brand new car, and that thing just as nice as it can be. He had a parallel park itself. You know, and I'm just so happy with that thing. And you see the joy and the enthusiasm in his voice as he's telling you that. Share his joy and his enthusiasm. And when he comes up to you and he says, let me tell you, my teenage son has just given me the toughest time I've ever had. I don't know how I'm going to deal with it. Stop and take the time to listen and empathize with him on what he's going through. And share, well, I'm saying to you is that worker that you're next to, that pagan that doesn't know the Lord, share what they're going through. Bear their burdens with them. Laugh with them. Cry with them. Talk with them. And let them see Jesus Christ minister through you. Amen? Amen? That's what you need to do. That's how you're going to win. Now, there's a couple of things I want to talk about I don't want you to do. It's, it's called, that's called lifestyle evangelism. It's living the life of Jesus Christ. But here's some things I don't want you to do, and I'll close with these. First of all, don't brag. Don't go to work and brag about how wonderful your Christian life is. Don't brag about how righteous you are and how God has changed you from what you want. I'm talking about in a brighter nation. Now, you can say you live the life that shows you've been changed. But don't go rubbing your nose in it. Don't go around telling how you used to carouse and run around and be unfaithful to your husband or wife and now you don't do that anymore. Just, just be yourself. Be the changed creature that you are. So don't brag, and then don't nag. Don't brag, don't nag. Don't carry a big Bible under your arm, and every time they say a curse word, say, you're going to hell for this. <laughs> Amen. They like to take and hit you over the head with it. Say amen. You know I do. Listen, don't say thou shalt not swear every time you brag about what a hangover, every time they brag about what a hangover they have, don't pull it out and say, well, all drunkards are going to spend eternity in hell. You say, well, that's true. It's true. But, you know, I found a long time ago, you can catch more flies with sugar with honey than you can with vinegar. And, then, and that's like pouring vinegar on the wound. Just let them see it and say, well, you know, I know you feel bad today. I know you're feeling bad. I'll be praying for you. I hope you, hope you feel better soon. That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do. Don't brag. Don't nag. Don't nag. And then don't lag. As a Christian, it's important for you, you to do your job and do it well. You know what? As a child of God, listen to me, folks. Listen to me. Listen carefully. As a child of God, you ought to be the best worker that employer has. You ought to be there on time or early. And by the way, quit stealing from your employer. Don't ever steal from them. How many of you here ever stole from your employer? Yeah. So how did I do that? Look at my wrist. I'm going to my wrist. Let me just give you an example. <coughs> you get a 15-minute break. You ever take 20? You just stole five minutes. Boy, it's quiet in here. Shannon did it usually just quiet. I don't know. <laughs> 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 so that's what I'm saying to you. That's how, listen, you ought to be the one that goes on break on time, comes back on time, or a few minutes early. You ought to be the best employer that that, that employer has, the best employee that that employer has. You ought to be setting an example for the others around you. Go out of your way. If you're lazy, if you're slothful in the job, then it's a poor testimony for the Lord. So you do your job and do it well. So then fourthly, don't, <laughs> don't sag. Be careful. Don't go back to your old lifestyle. Be really careful not to listen to their language and start to use it yourself. Be careful not to see the bright lights and the distant cities that you used to go to and be enticed. Um, as I said, if you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, after a while they'll come up to you and say, I know two different. What caused that difference? And then you'll be 
able to tell them because they're hurting. You know what? Most of the time I find people have a big smile on their face a lot of times at the greatest hurts in their heart. Amen? Back in the ch 29th chapter of Jeremiah, God gave instructions to the children of Israel as to how they should be paid in a pagan environment. This is how he said it behave. Jeremiah 29, verse 5 through 7. Build houses and live in them. God's talking to the people of Israel in a pagan nation. He said, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to men and marry so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not, you know, do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city. I have I, I, seek the welfare of the city I have afforded to you. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. For when it is pray, have prosperity, you will prosper. Pray for them. Those are some very practical instructions for living in a pagan country. I think they're very practical instructions for working in a secular pagan environment. I think they're listen. We're in exile. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. We're in exile, but we're here in this country. In the meantime, I'm here, and while I'm here, God said, son, down, build a house, plant a garden. No, Lord, I don't want to farm. Get married and have children. Find wives for your sons. Marry your daughters off. They too will have children. Go out and work and prosper, because as the city prospers, you too will prosper. You say, you say, to be a God person, you got to be different. And yet blend into society. Don't give in to their way of doing things. Daniel didn't. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't give in. They went so far that they said, this is as far as we go. Now, when, when your employer says, I'm going to get put politically incorrect for this. I never have been politically incorrect. When your employer asks you to do something that is contrary to the word of God, contrary to you know what God would have you to do, that's when you draw the line. Right? As God is my employer, I'll just give you an example. We have it in our Constitution now, so I'm never going to have it. Tabernacle Baptist Church will not perform a same sex marriage. I'm saying we draw a line. That's contrary to what God says in His Word. We're not going to do it. So if your employer asks you to, to cheat somebody, to steal from one of your one of his customers, that's contrary to the word of God. Amen. Amen. And I'll tell you something, God will honor you if you take a stand in that, in that situation. But short of that, if he asks you, if he says, oh, look, I know you work 45 hours this week, but I really need another 15. Can you do it? If you can do it, do it. Now if you got money to get home, you can't do it. But I tell you if you can do it. Honor him. In so doing, you honor God. Look at that. Lord, I know I know I need that here, but I want you to put that verse back up there. Ephesians 6 5. If you can. Just throw it back up there. Um, because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to honor God in all we do for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, uh, Slaves, which we call it workers, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Don't work only when being watched in order to please men, but as slaves of Christ, do the will of God from your heart. That's what we're to do as Christians. So, carry your heart this morning. Take it to your workplace Tuesday morning. Now, you take your workplace this morning if you want to, but you probably go over there. As we said, it's after somebody's there. But take it Tuesday morning and say, I'm going to go in and I'm going to labor to the best of my ability to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to please men, but to please God. Then you bow down to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. You're here.